Hey. hey. You, just, you just had to approach. As soon as he walks up. You just had to approach, brother. All right. You just had to show up. <laughs> um, Matt, let's, let's pray first. I know we prayed and we keep praying, but, but let's pray again. Lord God, we love you. We thank you that you love us so much. Man, you have done some amazing things to get our attention. And, and we just love you back. Father God, there might be people in here today that don't know you, that haven't made that decision yet. And I pray they would pay attention and listen. Lord God, there are people that, have been, <laughs> that are in this room this morning that have followed for decades, Lord God. And we just pray that they would listen as well. And for all of us in between, Lord God, speak to us. Speak to us. We want to hear your voice. We want to know where you're leading us. We want to know where you're taking us. We want to go where you're leading. We want to get covered in the dust of our Savior, our, our rabbi. We want to get covered in our teacher's dust. We want to go where you're going. We want to see what you're seeing. We want to be involved in what you're involved in. So Jesus, please help us, teach us. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear your heart. We want to hear your heart. And I need to be calmed down. <laughs> I just ask that you give me a spirit of peace right now so that I be able to bring this, Lord God, without too many tears um, so that people can understand what your Holy Spirit is trying to say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Ah, good morning, good morning, good morning. All right. We're going to start there. Acts 2, 16, 21. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, <laughs> blood and fire and billowing smoke. The sun turning black and the moon blood red before the day of the Lord arrives. The day tremendous and marvelous. And whoever calls out for help to me, God will be saved. That's from the message. If you guys are trying to follow along in your Bibles, I probably messed you up. Um, so that's the message interpretation. All right? Keep that in your minds and in your hearts. This is our outline this morning. We're going to start with hope. Hope leads us to repentance. Um, hopefully, it leads us to fasting. I'm not very big on that. I, I'm big in a different way. Um, then we go to Jesus, and then revival, freshness, abundant life. We all want to live there. And the mission, commission. are rumors in back alleys and whispers on the streets that something is changing, shifting right under our feet. There's talk of revolution, of uprising, of threat. They think that they're a match for God, but they've seen nothing yet. This is more than revolution, rebellion or coup. This is a world awakening, a new dawn breaking through. There is a battle coming, but like no war we've seen before. It's a fight with no weapons on our knees behind closed doors. It's a ripple of revival going town to town. It's a generation rising up as heaven's coming down. And we've got battle scars, yes, but our saviour bled as well. And we've got heaven burning when the world gives us hell. It's the power of a hurricane with the tenderness of spring. It's a fearsome battle cry that my soul can't help but sing. There's an army rising up of faithful people on their knees, whisper prayers on their lips and tears no one sees. With open hands and open hearts bowed before the cross, the cross where our Redeemer died as heaven's greatest loss. But death could not defeat him, the grave couldn't keep him in, and now the cosmos thunders the returning of the King. We're not a lost generation, one by one we're stepping up, and we're an unstoppable force for every door that is shut. Every one a precious child held close by God above, every one a mighty warrior holding weapons of love. There is strength in our silence and power in our prayer. These dry bones are stirring like a fresh breath of air. In those back alleys and dark corners of the streets, in unsuspecting places, people start to meet. 
Not just churches and chapels, but basements and bars. Not just hymns from a hymn book, but worshipful hearts. Not just silent communion and iron Sunday best, but a cross in your bio and hashtag blessed. We're the army rising up, the children of salvation, and we're here to take our place on holy battle stations. We're the real freedom fighters, rebels with a cause, and we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them on the shores, we'll fight them with no armor but the gospel in our hands, and we'll fight with a cry that says, your kingdom come across this land. So, that's just a little bit of how I usually start out stuff with the kids in the youth group, all right? They're, they're, they're kind of used to that right now. So, so I usually play, like, something that inspires, right? And usually on the theme that I'm going to talk about. So by, by, by what we just saw and by what we just read in Acts, we're going to be talking about revival, right? Um, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Revival looks really weird and strange in a Pentecostal church, okay? Um, I have not seen revival outside of a Pentecostal church. Would love to, and hopefully this stirs us to get us there, okay? Um, does it look like, does revival look like revival in a Pentecostal church, in a non-Pentecostal church? I have no idea. But boy, do I want to see and I want to find out, um, and, and revival is, revival may not be something that you think it is, but we'll get there. We're going to start with hope. That was our outline, right? Hope. It was a few months ago, our pastor got up here and was preaching a sermon, and I usually pay attention, usually write some notes down. I had my notebook that day and was writing some notes down. And he said something in that sermon. He said, the light's here and it's getting brighter. And something just went, whoa, hey, that's truth. And I don't know if you put a a verse in there or not. I have no idea. But my soul went, oh, that's true. Okay, so if that's true, it's got to be in the word somewhere, right? Right? All truth can be found in there, right? So, so we look around at this world, and we see darkness, and we see lying, and, and cheating, and conniving, and, and backstabbing, and, and hurt, and pain, and um, just a whole bunch of mess, right? Well, what Pastor said was it's light, and it's getting brighter. The light is here, and the darkness is passing, that doesn't look like truth. That doesn't look like truth at all. But it is. And it took me months to find it. That truth can be found in Proverbs 4.18. But the path of righteousness is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The path of the righteous, our path. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's our path. It starts out tiny. It starts out really like dawn, right? You can start to see shadows. You can start to see trees. It's not all blackness anymore, right? And the further you walk along this path, the further you walk along this trail, it gets brighter and brighter. Truth from the word of God. Truth that I didn't, I knew was right, but didn't find out and solidify it until I found Proverbs 4.18. When I heard that that morning, we get in the car, me and my wife and the kids get in the car and we go home. And usually the question comes from my side, my wife's side of the car saying, so what did you learn today, right? What, what, what stirred your heart today? What, what got you thinking? And I said, it's light and it's getting brighter. She kind of was like, what? <laughs> and I said, I said that, that did something in me. And it did. It did something in me. 
that I can point back to that point in my life and tell you that's where God started my revival. That's where God started to bring me back to doing what I was supposed to be doing. Living the way I was supposed to be living. If you took a look at our family, you were a fly on the wall in our family two to three months ago. You would see a complete difference if you were a fly today. Was I horrible? (laughs) In some ways, I was horrible. Was I totally godless? No. No, I loved God. I came to church. I paid my tithes. I loved my family. But that day, something happened in my spirit that I can point back to and say, that's where God started my revival. That's where God started me coming back to where I know he needs me to be. So this is something I wrote down. I said, the world says it's getting darker. God says it's getting brighter for the righteous. And then a question after that, who's the liar? And my, 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 my challenge to you right here in the beginning is to look for your hope. That's where it starts. You need to look for your hope. You need to look for that spark that gets you excited about doing what God has for you. And every one of you are somewhere where God wants you to be to minister to the people that are around you, to minister to the people that are in your lives. God doesn't make any mistakes. And where you're at is where you're going to do the most for him. And if you're not where you're supposed to be, where where God wants you to be, guess what? You start following him, and he'll put you in the place where you need to be. It's kind of guaranteed. Look for it. God will bring it. Moving on from hope. We all love this one, right? Repent. Fast. Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region, the shadow of death on them, a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began preaching, saying, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So you guys, can, you guys can talk. You guys can shout. You guys can amen. It's okay. Remember, Pentecostal background. All right. So there's the question. Repent. Does anybody know what repent means? Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Start living right. Start living different. Right? Let's, let's, let's do a change. If something's, if, if something's normal, man, and life was boring for me three months ago, not so boring anymore, I get to preach to youth on Thursday nights, right? I get to get involved in, in all the mess of youthliness, and it's amazing. Um, people tell me, people ask me, what do you like about your week? And I said, Sunday and Thursday. And they're like, Why? Well, Sunday I get to spend time with the youth from 4 to 6, and Thursday I get to spend time with our youth from uh, 6 to 8. Why does that make you so excited? I have no idea. I think I'm strange. (laughs) But I'm with a bunch of strange people, and we're trying to get together and know how to love God better, and how to hear God better, and where to go with what we've gotten. That is great English, Corey. Thank you. (laughs) Repent. God's kingdom is here. So did God's kingdom appear on a, a, like, ground? God's kingdom is not ground. Okay, he owns all this anyway. This is his. But God's kingdom is power. God's kingdom is sovereignty. God's kingdom is his rule, where he has authority. Okay? Okay? And he's given that authority to Jesus. And what did Jesus do before he left? He said, hey, I got this cool authority. 
It's now yours. Go and get them. Go and get them. Right? But first he said, repent. Turn around. We got to do something different. You can't live the same life you used to live. You got to do something different. You got to do something that I'm telling you to do. You got you to gotta go my way. This is in the message too. If you guys are turning pages, I'm sorry. You're probably going to have burn marks on your thumbs. Luke 24, 46 through 49. He said, you can see now how it is written that the Messiah suffers, raises from the dead on the third day. And then a total life change through the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed in his name to all nations, starting from here, from Jerusalem. You're the first to hear it and see it. You're the witnesses. What comes next is very important. I'm sending what my father promised to you. So stay here in the city until he arrives. Until you're equipped with power from on high. So that, that part in there, sir, it says a total life change. If it's not in the message, what do you think that word means? Repent, right? Total life change, repent. Total life change, repent. If you don't like the word repent, just put total life change in there, okay? And if we're following Jesus Christ, that's what he gives us. He gives us a total life change, right? I, I'm not bored anymore. I, I get to put my passion into what I love doing, right? I, I get to put my passion and my heart into a people, whether they, whether they respond to it or not, I love doing it. And that's my heart. That's part of my revival. I'll get to my, I'll get to my testimony here in a little bit. Let's move on to fasting. That's not fasting. Oh, it is. Sorry. All right. Acts 3, 19 through 21. Now it's time to change your ways, right? Repent. Turn, face God so he can wipe away your sins. Pour out showers of blessings to refresh you. And send the Messiah that he prepared for you, namely Jesus. For the time being, he must remain out of sight in heaven until everything is restored to order. Again, just the way God, through the preaching of his holy prophets of old, said it would be. Turn to God so he can refresh you. Turn to God so he can refresh you. Are you stale? Are things boring for you? Are, are things hard for you? Man, this week was hard for me. Um, you stand up here and you bring the word of God, it's going to be a hard week for you. Amen. Okay? The week after I preach is another hard week for me, and I don't know why. I'm not standing up and preaching the next Sunday. It just happens that way. The enemy likes to bookend Sunday with a bunch of mess. <laughs> Man, my kid would not sleep the other night. Would not sleep. Um, anyway, refreshing. How do we get refreshed? We repent. We, re we turn. We turn to Jesus saying, I'm just here today. I'm just here today, Dad. And I need your help. I need your help. I'm, I'm either bored and I don't know what to do with my time. I'm either hurting and I need you to help me heal. I'm just wondering if this is all real, if, if you're real. Can we be that real with God? Man, we can be that real with God. God, I don't know if you're there, but if you're there, please speak because I need you to help me. Forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me for what I've done. And he does. Matthew 4, 1 and 2. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Goodness knows he was hungry, right? If he's anything like me, which he says he is, because he was tempted in all ways that I am, that boy was hungry, all right? I go a day, a day without eating, and I'm like, oh, oh, please, I, I don't think I can make it three days, and I usually don't. 
I usually don't. T- t- telling on myself, I don't make it three. Um, I might make it to the night of the first and uh, then find some crackers in the cupboard or something. My wife's nodding her head, yes. So, so, so why is fasting so important? Why, why, and is it commanded? Are we commanded to fast? Ah, I love you. You have all the right answers. That's my next slide. Don't tell anybody. <clears throat> we are not commanded to fast. It does not say in the Bible anywhere, thou shalt not eat for three days and be supercharged with the Holy Spirit. All right? It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. It doesn't even give you a guarantee that you're going to be supercharged with anything else. Right? There is a story in the Bible where Jesus came down off the mountain and the 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 disciples were like, help us, Jesus, because we can't cast out this demon. And he said something that was really strange. He said, this one comes out only by prayer and fasting. And you're like, what? There's different ones? You just can't tell this one to leave in Jesus' name and it goes? No, you, you got to pray and you got to fast, boys. Have you been fasting? No, you haven't because you've been with the bridegroom. It's okay, I can handle this. Right? <laughs> Jesus gets in there and handles it. So no. We're not, expect, we're not commanded to fast, but this is what Jesus told everybody. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Not commanded to, but expected to. Okay? Corey, do you only fast food? If it's me, that's my biggest one, and I probably should fast food. You can fast anything you want to. If it's taking time out of your life, you can fast it. And we know what Corey's going to say next, right? If you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Snapchat, and it's taking up your time, you can fast it. If you're writing emails like crazy, you can fast it. If you got a sugar problem, you can fast the sugar. You will have a headache for a little bit, but you can fast the sugar. We're not commanded to, but we're expected to by our teacher. And if we want to get covered in his dust, we better do what he says. We need to do a lot more study on that subject, but we're going to move on from fasting. We're going to move on to the like cornerstone of this whole thing. This is where we really need to start, Right? This is where most of our hope, all of our hope is anchored. John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that order that the world might be saved through him. (laughs) Youth group, here's your question. Those of you that have been with me on Thursday nights, what does so mean? Abundance, thank you. Abundance. For God loved. Great. That's not what it says. It says, for God so loved. He didn't just love you. He didn't just kind of like you. He doesn't just kind of want to spend time with you on Friday night, but then after that, uh, we got church Sunday, so I don't want to see you till then. He so loves you. If that word so weren't there, he just loves us, right? I just love tacos, okay? But God so loved us that he couldn't stand being without us that he sent his son. 
You know how much pain that causes a father? I got four boys. I don't want to see any of them die for you. But he sent his son to die for everyone throughout all history. He gave them up. This is my youth pastor's quote. My youth pastor from way back in the day. I don't have a youth pastor now, of course. You are not the worst thing you have ever done. You are the best thing Jesus has ever done for you. When your identity is threatened... When who God tells you you are, you can put this back in his face. I am not the worst thing I have ever done. I am the best thing that Jesus has done for me. I am the best thing that Jesus has done for me. Definition of revival. I I think the dictionary doesn't give it justice. One, an act of, an act or instance of reviving. Thank you. What does reviving mean? Okay, the state of being revived, such as renewed attention or interest in something, a new presentation or publication of something, a period of renewed religious interest, and often highly emotional. Pentecostal, evangelistic meeting or series of meetings. Man, been in so many of those. Restoration of force, vitality, or effect. I kind of like that last one. Restoration of force, vitality, or effect. I think that one's closest to what I'm trying to get at this morning. So... We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So here's my testimony. Since that day that God brought hope back into my life, because I was in the dumps, I've served this country in the army, um, and it just seemed to get darker and darker, and I lost my hope. I didn't lose Jesus. But I lost my hope. My country is going a different direction than I fought for it to go. People are deciding to grab onto their own truth, which isn't truth, and live their lives by that instead of going to the book that is full of truth and living by that. And I was scared. I bought guns. I bought ammo, I bought stuff, right? No one's going to take my family. (laughs) When there's an explosion or like a firework or something in the neighborhood, man, I I get crazy. Go and look at all the windows, make sure all the doors are locked, check outside, check outside what's going on. (laughs) If I had a bunker, you'd be in there. Right? God, maybe a month, a month after he showed me that it's bright and it's getting brighter with the truth of the word confirmed, a month after that, I was going to youth camp. Josh said, hey, Corey, why don't you go to youth camp with us? And I said, there's no way I'm going to youth camp with you. Those kids are crazy. You'll walk out for you. And so God worked on me a little bit. And I was like, okay, how much does this thing cost? What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? I'll go, right? We were there, and the speaker, um, Randy's son, Brent, started teaching us about being covered in the dust of Jesus. If we're going to follow our teacher, we need to be so close to our teacher that we're getting covered in the dust he's kicking up, right? 
I'm like, man, that resonates. I want that. Let's, let's go after that. If this group of people is going to go after that, that's where I want to go. I want to go with them. So it was about two days, I think, after we were ministering and hanging out with each other and having fun, and, and you should see Big Corey do some of the things that we did at youth camp, all right? Um, they shoot tennis balls at you that could knock your, your dome off. It, it's, it's scary. I have a picture of it. <laughs> next to you. So we were sitting there. The, one of the mornings, we get together as leaders, and they say, hey, you know, how was last night? What was going on? Blah, 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 blah. Towards the end of the meeting, Jackie looks at me, and she goes, so what do you think? I knew exactly what she was asking. Like, what do you think about our kids? What do you think about your commitment to our kids? What do you think about helping out instead of just hanging out? <laughs> And I told her, <coughs> can't ever do it, can I? <coughs> I told her, I'm falling in love. And it's true. I fell in love with a group of kids that are crazy, yes. Some of them are on fire. Some of them don't know where they're going. Some of them know exactly where they're headed. Some need you just to sit down and talk to them. Some are just glad you're there. And some could care less. <laughs> but God turned me around by giving me a people that I could love. I should have had that slide on while I was talking about it. John 10.10. 10. A thief is only there to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they could have real and eternal life. More and better life than they ever dreamed of. More and better life than they ever dreamed of. If it wasn't in the message, that more and better life than they ever dreamed of is the word Abundant. Abundant life. Our, our youth group's name is Thrive. Thrive Youth Group, right? And I told him the other day, I said, I don't see us doing this. I don't see us thriving. I don't see us moving the way our, our title says we should be moving. Another word for thrive is, is abundant, right? Right? Another word for thriving is, 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 is so full of, of, of something that it's spilling out on other people. So full of God that it's spilling out on other people. That, is, that it's getting messy. That people are getting covered in the stuff that you're just flinging your hands around. And they're getting covered in it because it's, you're full. You're full of Jesus and you're just covering everybody else around you. We'll get there. If anything I have to do with it, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll get there. And the rest of our leaders, we'll get there. We were just talking about it Sunday, last Sunday. We'll get there. <laughs> and once they catch fire, they're going to start you all on fire. You don't have to wait till they catch fire, though. That's what this message is about. Next is mission. What is our mission? Remember Luke 24, 49. What comes next is very important. I'm sending what my father promised you, so stay here in the city until he arrives, until you're equipped with power from on high. What? God's going to send something else? Yeah, he's going to send something else. Acts 1, 6 through 11. When they were... Together for the last time, together with who? Together with Jesus. They asked, Master, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? Is this the time? 
right? Before he got crucified, they're like, man, this guy's going to take over. He's going to be king. And I'm like, right, one of his right-hand people, we're going to be sitting up there and, you know, it's going to be awesome, right? Then he gets crucified and killed and, and dead. And they're going, <laughs> whoops, I chose the wrong guy. And he comes back, and they're like, oh, whoa, oh, okay, it's back on, right? This kingdom thing's back on, right? We're, well, Rome's out, we're in, we're going to start doing stuff, it's going to be awesome, right? right? Jesus says seven, he told them, you don't get to know the time. Timing's the Father's business. What you'll get is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be able to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all over Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the world. These were his last words. As they watched, he was taken up and disappeared in a cloud. They stood there staring at this empty sky. Suddenly, two men appeared in white robes. They said, you Galileans, why did you just stand here looking up at an empty sky? This very Jesus who was taken up from among you to heaven will come as certainly and mysteriously as you left. Imagine that. Whoa, that's awesome. Hey, Pete, is he coming back? John, I don't know. Whoa, who are these white guys? White robes? What are you guys doing? You guys need to get going. Go do what he told you to do. Stop staring in the sky. A few of us need to stop staring in the sky. A few of us need to stop staring in the sky. Just come back, Dad. Just come back. The answer we're getting is, I've got stuff for you to do. Get going. Just come back. You're not listening to me. So, the good old Pentecostal answer for this is, why did we get the Holy Spirit? Pentecostal answer, speak in tongues, right? No. Uh, Prophesy, right? That's why we got the Holy Spirit. No. Do miraculous things. Is that what that says? What does that say? Come on. Give it to me, Chris. It says right there. Witness. Witness. To others. You're going to get the Holy Spirit to go and get, to go tell about me. You may get some cool other things. It's true. You might get tongues. You might get to know what people are, 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 are struggling with before you even know that person. You might be able to open your mouth and say something and then it comes true a few months or years down the road. But that's not the point, church. The point is, you get the Holy Spirit so you can get out there and tell people about Jesus, who then they get the Holy Spirit, and they go out and start telling people about Jesus, and then they get the Holy Spirit, and they start telling people about Jesus. Mm -hmm. (sighs) I don't know. You might need to to come back up right now. I don't know. (laughs) It's starting to get crazy up here. Okay. Um... We're going to play this, and then I'm going to come back with some final words. Look into the horizon. What do you see? It's like a rushing wave coming from the crystal sea. It's on the brink of manifestation. We have not yet reached our destination, for there's a shining light that yearns for this nation that will be placed on the hearts of this generation. 
where one has passed on, thousands more will awaken. You see the baton has been passed on, the mantle has transitioned, there lies a generation breaking off all resistance. Revival starts in our hearts, but it lives through persistence, a willingness to love God through our worldly conflictions. The revival in this generation is a mandated conviction. Revival is the answer to a generation of addiction. Revival is our cure to every form of sickness. Revival is God's call to a heart aligned with his vision. Revival is an action, a word inserted through incision. It cuts deep into our hearts. Praise God. Now, we die to ourselves and let Christ in, and in him we win. What are your words? Are you trying to live in the dead body of sin? You speak your mind and mute the spirit? Or is Christ in you speaking and you just don't hear it? What are your words? Are your words what you're perceiving? Or the words of the spirit interceding? Are you acting out in revival or living for survival? Listen closely. We need to awaken. Revival is here. Can't you hear? Understand, my Jesus declares, if we are silenced ourselves, the rocks will cry out. So let's give our lives and voices to the generation seeking it out. Let's end these suicides and genocides and homicides. Stop the church from living both sides and reach those who know not the one who comes with the white horse that he rides. He's calling you and me. You gotta understand what revival is. We're gonna declare it today. Listen, revival is repentance and humility. Revival is a move of God. Revival is full submission. Revival is not a one-time thing. Revival is the church coming together. Revival is sons and daughters coming home. Revival is mothers and fathers rising up to shepherd. Revival is getting God's perspective. Revival is souls saved. Revival is seeds planted. Revival is activation. Revival is faith being released. Revival is intercession rising up. Revival is taking up spiritual ground. Revival is spiritual climate change. Oh my goodness, revival is religious walls and competition being broke down. Revival is family. Revival is you. And revival is me. And no, revival starts with you. And revival starts with me. Coming together to see God released. Amen. So I've heard that word a lot lately. That's what got me thinking, the word revival. That's what got me thinking about this message is God took me through some, some things and he let me see that revival was working in my life. Me coming back alive was working in my life. I don't know if you know this about me, but I spent four years in college studying to be a pastor. I got out of being in college and went and became a kid's pastor. Well, you thought I was crazy with youth. You should have seen me with kids. We had a great time as a kid's pastor. After that point in my life, I got hurt by the church, by people in the church. And I decided I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be in church. I don't want to tell people about God in church anymore. I'll tell them on the street or, or whatever. Whatever you have for me other than being in front of people on a Sunday morning or at a youth group or at kids' church, I'll do it for you, God. <laughs> 18 years ago... <clears throat> I said no to where you want me to go and what you want me to be. Fast forward 18 years, I'm standing in front of you and the youth group every week, loving them, loving on you this morning, telling you this is the way to go, follow it. 18 years, gone. 18 years wasted? Maybe. I have a lot of friends that are in the ministry. Their ministries are amazing. A lot of them. It doesn't matter the size. It matters about the heart and 
the people you help and change. And for 18 years, I didn't do it. (laughs) But thank God, church, he didn't give up on me. And he's not giving up on you. He has a place for you. He has people he needs you to talk to. Because me, pastor, the, the elders of the church, we can't reach the people you can reach. He needs you to reach him. So now, I, I, I don't say I got revival completely, but man, am I different. Was I saved before? Yes, I was saved. I knew Jesus Christ. I prayed to my God. I prayed to Jesus. I knew I was saved. I was just bored and scared and defeated. I had no hope. Now I have hope. Now my life's changing. And where we go from here, I have no idea. But I know it's going to be crazy and fun, scary and adventurous. For us, too. It's going to be scary sometimes. It's going to be fun sometimes. It's going to be adventurous. Man, I was nervous trying to get up here this morning. To be honest with y'all. People were praying for me. My wife was holding my hand. Even my little boy, Joshua, was like, Dad, just hold me and we'll calm down. That helped, I think, the most. I don't know why. I think I saw Jesus holding me like I was holding him. Saying, it's okay, son. I got your words. You just need to get up there and tell them about me. (laughs) Oh. That's for you. (laughs) Um... We as a youth group are going to start doing some things differently. Um, we're going to start moving in a direction that we haven't done in our youth group, at least since I've been here. Missions trip has not been a part of our youth group's vocabulary. Um, no, I'm not just going to send them to Uruguay, right? We're not just going to dump them out in the jungle somewhere. Um, I have some connections with the reservation. We have some people down in Phoenix. uh, Feed my starving children. Needs people to pack up boxes. That's missions stuff. And we're going to start getting involved in doing that kind of thing. But if we're going to go out and do that, we need you to help us. A lot of our kids aren't working, right? A lot of our kids go to school, get get pummeled by the enemy week after week, go home, do homework, and then come to church on Thursday nights, come to church on Sundays, and do it all over again, over and over again. They need your support. I don't know how much things are going to cost. I don't know how much we're going to need. This isn't just a plea for your funds. This is a plea for your prayers. This is a plea for when you're fasting, fast and remember us. This is a plea from a heart that says, please don't forget about us. We may be crazy. We may be off the wall sometimes. But we're the future. Don't forget about us. We need your prayers. We need your money. (laughs) And we need you to come alongside us. Come and put your arm around us someday and say, hey, what's going on? How can I help? What can I pray for? 
How's school going? So each one of us is somewhere in this, this morning. Either we need hope, either we need to start with Jesus, or we're in that time of revival and freshness and abundant living, or we need to find our mission, our co-mission, because it's not just ours. God gives us it, and God goes with us. And man, does he do like almost all of the work if you're just saying, God, I'll go. Maybe he's asking some of you, hey, when they go on those mission trips, maybe you want to go with us. Come along. You need to get background checked first because we want to have good people around our kids. <laughs> well, that's the truth. You got you to gotta, you gotta cover yourself, right? So that's my heart this morning. If you need hope, look for it. If you need to repent, if you need to fast, do it. If you need Jesus, he's here. And he's knocking on the door. Just let him in. And if you need a mission... There's mission all around us. There's mission at work. There's mission in our town. There's mission in the groups of our church. Mm, Let's pray. Lord God, we love you. We love you. Holy Spirit, take these words that have been spoken this morning, get rid of all the junk that was said And let everything that we remember be gold, precious jewels, stuff that we can build the kingdom with in our own lives. And give you an opportunity this morning, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, to do it. Jesus looked down through eternity And he didn't see you down there. He asked the Father, he said, why are they not here? The Father said, someone has to go. Someone has to go and tell them, and someone has to take their sin. Someone has to pay the price. Well, Father, I'll go, said Jesus. And he did. Came, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, rose three days later. And then like we saw today, got taken up through the clouds. He's waiting to come back. He's waiting to come back. And like he said, only the Father knows when it's time. And Jesus is just waiting to come back. Jesus, can I go now? Or Father, can I go now? No, Jesus, you need to wait. Father, can I go now? They need me. No, Jesus, you need to wait. It's not time yet. People need to make the decision. So I'm going to let you have an opportunity to make that decision. If God's knocking on the door of your heart, if Jesus is asking you, please let me in, I just want to come in and talk with you. I just want to come in and and, and give you the beginning point to this amazing, crazy life. No, it's not going to be easy. No, it's not going to be cupcakes and soft pretzels and gooey, gooey stuff all the time. There's going to be some hard times. There's going to be some hard things. There's going to be some hard decisions and choices and heart-wrenching tragedies sometimes. I'm going to make you this promise, Jesus says. I'm going to go with you through it all. If you just open the door and let me in, I'll go through it with you all the way. And then you won't have to ever die. You just get to be with me. And we get to go and do amazing, crazy things for the rest of eternity. 
It's not a fairy tale. It's not a story we tell ourselves to make us feel better. It's a truth. <sighs> and there is a there is a connection with you raising your hand in the air. Everybody's eyes are closed. Everybody's head's bowed. So nobody's looking around. This is between you, me, and God. Okay? This is your decision. By saying, I want to accept Jesus Christ into my life. Whether you've done it 17,000 times and you want to start new and fresh or you're going to do this for the first time. I'm going to count to three. By the end of three, you can raise your hands and make that commitment. It's between you and God. Nobody's going to get in your business. I'm not going to come to you and say, hey, how's that decision going? What I challenge you to do, if you do raise your hand, is to find somebody to talk about it with. Pastor, our elders, me, um, Find somebody to talk about it with because we want to talk about it with you. We want to join in the celebration that's going to happen in heaven by you raising your hand and saying, I want Jesus. Because it's in the word of God that there's a party that happens when you raise your hand and say, I want the Lord. Not even raising your hand, just believing. So at three, I want you to raise your hand if you've never accepted Jesus Christ. If it's your 17,000th time giving your life to the Lord, you go ahead and raise your hand. One, two, three. Lord God, we love you and exalt you, and we need you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. For the rest of us, this is our challenge. What do we do to not live a boring life? What do we do? We're not feeling challenged. What do we do? We're not feeling motivated. What do we do? I'm not feeling fed. <laughs> well, are you feeding? Are you giving? Are you loving? Are you getting involved? Are you giving what God is giving you to somebody else? And that's my challenge. We got, we got four. Find your hope. <sighs> Repent. Fast. Come back to the Lord. Find your refreshing. Find your abundance in Jesus. And then get on mission. Get on point. Go out there and start making great gains for the kingdom of God and destroying the kingdom of the enemy. Destroy the kingdom of the enemy by loving people, by telling people about Jesus. They get filled with the Holy Spirit and start telling people about Jesus. And then they go and get the Holy Spirit and tell people about Jesus. <sighs> Father God, light us on fire. Father God, I want to burn for you. It says in your word, if you be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Lord, we lift you up in this place this morning. We love you. We exalt you. You are worthy of praise. Don't let us be the same. Let it be so hard for us to stay the same. Change us, I pray. Change the way we think. Change our hearts. Change us, Lord God. Change us and help us change Prescott Valley. Change us and help us change Prescott. Change us and help us change the ridge, Prescott Valley. Change us, Lord God, so we can change the stuff around us. Don't let us be the same, Dad. Please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.